our next speaker is uh, Kevin Pixley. So he's I'm, 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 I'm pleased to introduce Kevin from uh, CIMIT. Uh, Kevin graduate, graduated from the Purdue University. He did a master's in the University of Florida and a PhD at the Iowa State University in plant breeding. Uh, then he joined the International Mason Wheat Improvement Center in 1990 and worked as a maize breeder in Eastern and South Africa for 11 years before directing the maize and genomic resource programs uh, at CIMIT. So he's currently serving as a deputy director general for research in breeding and, ge and genetics. And he also oversees projects ex exploring germoplast bank diversity, applying quantitative genetics to accelerate breeding programs and implementing gene edit editing for disease resistance in maize and wheat. Um, um, so, and the title of the talk is Innovative Approaches to Use Maize Genetic Diversity in Achieving Food Security. Um, so thank you, Kevin, and please go ahead. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, can you just confirm that you hear me and you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So thank you very much to the organizers and to Alfredo Herrera Estrella for inviting me to make this presentation. Uh, I'll be presenting work of, of many colleagues, uh, particularly Sarah Hearn and Terry Molnar, and a little bit of work from Martha Wilcox, uh, who was with us uh, until a few years back. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, innovative approaches to use maize genetic diversity towards achieving food security. And I'll try to advance my, there we go. So I, I think we, we all know that um, the value of wild relatives has been tremendous. Uh, this graph from, from a paper from Hajar and Hodgkin shows uh, contributions from wild relatives to various crop species uh, that you can see across the, the, the bar graph here. Uh, and an estimate was that over a hundred billion dollars in annual value uh, from uh, biodiversity into crop breeding uh, are realized. So this is, this is an amazing value uh, that crop biodiversity brings, not only from wild relatives, but also from our gene bank collections. So in the, in the CGIAR, uh, we have uh, all the gene banks that you see on the screen, uh, and we, we save and we conserve and we distribute uh, germplasm around the world uh, from these various uh, germplasm banks. So we have more than 770,000 uh, accessions. Most of them are seed, uh, and they're kept. You see the picture you see here in the center is the germplasm bank at CIMIT, uh, where we have maize and wheat. And our collections are also backed up uh, at Svalbard uh, in Norway and also uh, at the USDA uh, germplasm bank in the United States. Every year we distribute seed to many, many different uh, scientists and students uh, and others around the world. Uh, you can see on this summary from one year, which was 2018, uh, that we sent, what is that? If you add them up more than uh, 50,000 uh, shipments uh, to different parts. And most of those shipments, about 77%, uh, were to uh, recipients in low and middle income countries. Uh, and you can see Mexico here features quite, quite high on the list. So number four, I, I figured overall it was number five in terms of receiving the largest number of uh, accessions and, and seed from the CIMIT and CG germplasm banks. So why do we do this? I mean, the, the conservation of these materials in germplasm banks costs literally millions of dollars uh, every year. Just for the CGIAR, probably we spend $25 million uh, each year uh, to conserve these. And of course, we do it so that uh, we can be sure, we can assure that we do not lose genetic diversity of our crops. Uh, as, as Sarah mentioned in the previous presentation, these are the raw materials for the varieties that we will need going into the future. Uh, and because this is a crucial resource, and we want to make sure that it remains accessible uh, for use by future generations. I think you're probably all familiar with this graph, so I won't dwell on it, but these are predictions of the needs for maize and wheat uh, going to the year 2050. If you see these dashed green lines, these are the projected demand by year 2050 uh, FAO production projections. These solid lines underneath are the current rates. So if we maintain the current rates of productivity increases, this is the amount that we will achieve 
by 2050. And then if we take the, the, um, the challenges from climate change and from water and nutrient um, scarcities, uh, we could in fact see a, a lowering of this uh, current trend. So really we, we can't continue doing the same things. We have to be smart about using biodiversity, about using uh, plant breeding technologies to be able to meet the needs. And so I'm gonna present to you three examples of what, we're, what we've been doing at CIMIT uh, with many partners uh, to be able to make better use of genetic diversity in our germplasm banks. The vision, in a nutshell, we have these canisters, these containers of seed in the germplasm bank, but to all uh, intensive purposes, they, it's like going into a supermarket where none of the uh, containers on the shelf have labels. And our job is to put labels on them so that breeders can actually say, okay, there's the one that I need uh, to be able to find heat tolerance or to be able to find disease resistance. So the first example that I'll share with you I don't know why this is showing, uh, it's blocking part of my slide uh, with the, the upper bar, but it's not too distracting. So this maize lethal necrosis disease is the first one that I'll talk about. Maize lethal necrosis is a, a serious problem, uh, particularly in Eastern Africa, where it causes 22% yield loss on average uh, nationally uh, and up to 100% in severely affected fields. And it's caused by, by the interaction of, of two uh, different viruses uh, within the plant. So my colleague, Terry Molnar, uh, decided he would like to explore the diversity in the germplasm bank uh, to see if we can find novel sources of resistance uh, to maize lethal necrosis. And he set out to identify 1,000 accessions to be evaluated in the greenhouse and then to select the best ones for use in breeding programs. And he used both, um, both the data from the passport uh, of our passport information for the germplasm bank accessions, uh, as well as uh, information about the types of um, uh, diseases that occur in the different regions that they came from. Uh, he was also sampling different races of, of maize. You can see in the bottom table uh, that he explored a, a large number of races and a large number of uh, original countries from which these uh, accessions came from, and only choosing materials uh, from regions of between zero and 1500 meters uh, above sea level. He then used genomic data because we, we have genotyped almost all of the accessions in our germplasm bank. You can see in the, in the graph here on the top left, this is a, a, a graph of all of the germplasm diversity that, that he selected based on the previous criteria. Then he made a subset so that he represented all of the countries. Then he further subselected using uh, the race racial uh, complements to make sure that he represented all the different races. And finally used genetic diversity to represent the maximum amount of genetic diversity from the original uh, in selecting 1000. Uh, accessions that he then took to the glass house. And you can see down here, Terry uh, screening in the glass house uh, and selecting those that were susceptible, of course, eliminating or, or not selecting those that were susceptible and keeping those that are resistant. And having done that, he was able to identify 20 uh, accessions. And you can see them here. It's not probably not important to try to study which ones they were, but these are the ones that had very high levels of resistance to either one of the two causal viruses uh, or both of them. And, and then he initiated breeding programs, crossing them to elite materials. Uh, and those crosses made it into the field in uh, Naivasha, Kenya, where they were infested with uh, MLN uh, so that they could be screened and, and selected. And, and now they're being used in the breeding programs of our teams in Mexico, sorry, in, in Kenya primarily. And the important thing here is that these are novel sources of diversity because until today, we've primarily relied on one single source of resistance. Uh, and so this gives us quite some, some security in terms of an, e an eventual potential breakdown uh, of resistance to that one source that had previously been used exclusively in our breeding work. So the second example I'd like to share with you is, is a traditional classic uh, GWAS uh, analysis. Uh, again, looking for resistance to a disease. And this is a, a disease called tar spot complex. Uh, and it's, it's very important in Mexico. You can see its distribution, all the areas in this map 
that are yellow are areas where this disease is, is problematic. Uh, it can cause up to 100% uh, yield loss, uh, and it affects almost a million hectares uh, across Mexico, and, and that area is in fact expanding. So we did a quick calculation. If we assumed only 20% grain yield reduction, uh, that would be equivalent to over 300,000 tons of lost grain uh, worth about 60 billion uh, US dollars. So a, a very serious problem, uh, and again, limited sources of resistance available. So uh, this, this was work done by Martha Wilcox and, and many other colleagues, and they actually took a breeder's core collection uh, and they used 4,500 accessions from the bank. And they took one plant uh, from each accession uh, to cross it onto single cross testers. So they made three-way uh, hybrids uh, using one plant from each accession. And one of the more interesting scientific discussions I've had was discussing the strategy for this project. And the idea eventually was it, it would be okay to take just one plant per accession, because if you think of all of maize, all of the accessions in the gene bank as one population, so that is the population maize, then you would expect to find many replications of any given haplotype within that collection. Uh, and so we'd rather sample more accessions than more thoroughly sample individual accessions. So this was what was done. About uh, 3,500 F1 hybrids were evaluated in yield trials uh, at 36 different locations. All the materials, uh, the accessions were genotyped uh, with DART-seq uh, methodology. And therefore this allowed us to do a, a, your traditional uh, GWAS analysis. And just so you keep this in mind, the cost of phenotyping these materials was probably about two and a half million US dollars. Whereas the cost of genotyping was perhaps 350,000. So what resulted from all this work? Uh, some pretty exciting uh, results. You can see the, of course, difference between a highly susceptible and, and quite resistant plant uh, in this photograph. And what um, Wilcox and colleagues found was 41 QTL associated with resistance uh, to uh, tar spot disease complex. But they focused on the ones that had either, well, both the highest uh, effect uh, on tar spot resistance and therefore on yield but also the ones that were particularly rare in elite materials. So you can see on, on, this, on these graphs, the effect of each QTL. So here we have about, a, on the, the, the biggest effect QTL had about a 25% reduction uh, in terms of leaf damaged area and an impact on tons per hectare of nearly two tons per hectare. So a pretty big effect. And the color red here indicates that that allele was at a frequency of less than 1% among elite materials. So this is a novel allele that can be extremely useful uh, in our breeding programs. And you can see quite a number of these alleles that are hardly present in elite materials uh, and some that are present at very, very low frequencies and therefore novel diversity for use uh, in our breeding programs. So now the, <clears throat> the, new, the newest method, which I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation uh, describing to you, is, is talking about taking advantage of 10,000 years of evolution uh, in maize. And of course, this is a, a pretty photograph showing the, the visual um, diversity <clears throat> in, in maize. So what we do in this, in this approach that we're, we're going to call, that we call environmental GWAS, it's a special form uh, of GWAS, is to extend the, the, the concept by using information from the germplasm bank passport data together with information from uh, genotyping the materials. <clears throat> so nearly all of the land races in our gene bank have been genotyped using DART-seq, a high density genotypic genotyping platform. And for over 17,000 of the land races in, in the bank, we have quite good geolocation information uh, in their passport data. So we can, we can know quite precisely where they were collected. And this opens up a tremendous opportunity to then go and find uh, environmental data, climate data, precipitation, temperatures, soils data, uh, using various databases uh, that describe based on the geolocation. Uh, and we can then determine what was the, the what were the environmental characteristics of that locate of that location where each of these accessions 
uh, were collected. One interesting thing here is that you, you, depending on when they were collected, we might have to think about the effects of climate change. So here you can see the, the annual mean temperatures uh, actually start to increase quite rapidly after about 1950. Uh, so at the time that collections were collected, the environment may have been different uh, than it is today. And so we have to actually think of the environment at the time uh, when these were collected. So some basic assumptions to apply environmental GWAS. Uh, of course, we, we expect that land races because of natural and also human selection uh, become adapted to the environment or the specific geolocations where they were uh, eventually collected from. Across a, a wide range of locations, there are environmental gradients. I mean, clearly there are differences in the environments uh, in different parts of the world, and, and therefore the materials have adapted to those different environments. And also because you know, we, we know the, the routes by which maize was taken from its centers of origin uh, to new areas where there's been novel diversity uh, evolving in different environments, uh, we can then associate uh, both the, you know, using, um, using genetic structure analysis, uh, we can look at the original uh, locations that these came from and their environmental data, as well as the new locations, which could be in this case, uh, West Africa. I hope you can see my mouse uh, as I move it around. Uh, West Africa, uh, which we can also look at the conditions uh, of the environment and of the soils, uh, and we can do an analysis considering both the original center of diversity, uh, as well as the more recent uh, center or location of adaptation. So here's, here's one example of, of what's been done. And this is using uh, genomic data to predict uh, the adaptation of materials. So as I mentioned, we've genotyped uh, more than 17,000 different accessions from the bank, uh, and we know where they've been collected. So you use, of course, a training set uh, to calibrate and say, okay, what is the genomic uh, basically a genomic selection index uh, that can best represent materials coming from, in this case, an environment with a high probability of drought occurrence uh, versus low probability of drought occurrence. And then you use that training set to predict uh, whether other accessions in the gene bank uh, would be adapted to or come from uh, drought prone areas or not. Uh, and, and the results are quite astounding. You see a very high uh, correlation uh, between uh, the genomic uh, model that's developed based on this uh, training set uh, and the actual um, geolocation or environmental characteristics of where they came from. Now we can turn this around and we can actually look at uh, the climate data instead of the genomic data. And based on climate data, try to predict the genotypes uh, that would best fit in, into that environmental, uh, climatic environmental region. And so in this example, they used uh, locations uh, with data, sorry, with, with uh, environmental characteristics uh, that are representative of these uh, areas in red dots. You can see them also uh, up in this part of, of Mexico, warm, warm uh, somewhat dry areas. Uh, and you make a training panel from that. And then they predicted, uh, based on these weather data, uh, which accessions would be best adapted to this type of climate. And they validated this in a location in Yucatan, uh, where they grew materials that were either predicted to be well adapted or poorly adapted. And here you can see uh, in the graph on the right-hand side, uh, the distance from predicted genotype, as the distance gets larger, the performance at this location went down in a very good uh, correlation. So this is all telling us that we can in fact successfully use uh, environmental data to develop models, genomic models that help us to predict what genotypes are going to be most adapted to uh, a given environment that, of, of interest. So just to, to summarize the concept of classical GWAS, we combine a genotype with a phenotype and that allows us to detect associations between SNPs uh, and a trait of interest. It could be, I gave you uh, an example of tar spot resistance. Uh, in environmental GWAS, we combine genotype data with collection site environmental data. Uh, and this allows us to identify variables uh, that are associated with uh, adaptation to these 
uh, environments. And I'll show you a couple examples in the, in the next two or three slides. So this is just a, a quick, you know, the, the, the map is showing differences in precipitation uh, and based on association with of the GWAS panel of 2,700 accessions with the precipitation data, uh, they identified one very large uh, QTL peak, which is, uh, associates, or at least the, the putative gene is the heat shock factor uh, HSFT uh, F9. Uh, which is known also to be associated with uh, drought uh, tolerance. Now in, a, in a similar uh, example from the same GWAS panel, they, they found another peak. And in this case, they, and this is on chromosome one, uh, they were able to associate a, a candidate gene, which is actually a transporter uh, gene uh, associated with glutathione, which is known to have a role in, in drought tolerance. Uh, and they were able to identify that this SNP that they, that they identified associated with that gene uh, was being selected by the environmental GWAS. Now, they validated this, and the graph you see on the right-hand side here takes that one SNP. So differences for that one SNP, uh, what condition? Is it homozygous recessive? Is it heterozygous or homozygous um, dominant or homozygous uh, large, large, large um, effect allele? And what we can see is that there's a big difference in terms of yield under drought, uh, depending on which state of this uh, allele uh, was present. So this was done with, with 1,000 test cross hybrids grown under drought uh, and, un, and under uh, well-irrigated conditions, and clearly validating that the gene identified by environmental GWAS does have an important effect. And then they went to the B73 uh, expression data, and they were able to show that Indeed, in both, um, in both vegetative and reproductive tissue, there are different expression levels uh, under well-watered and drought conditions uh, for this uh, allele. So this graph shows you five other examples of genes that they did similar work for. And you can see each, each column uh, shows one gene. So at the bottom, you see the, the typical Manhattan plot, which identifies a, a SNP or a candidate gene uh, of uh, high potential uh, significance. And you can see in the, in the graph above the, the grain yield under drought, uh, sorry, dry, dry grain weight under either irrigated or drought conditions. And you can see that for each of these five genes, there's quite a difference between the performance, uh, whether it has the allele that was coming from adaptation to low rainfall areas versus high rainfall areas. And so you, you can find alleles that are common in low rainfall areas that will give you uh, an advantage or a disadvantage under drought conditions uh, and become targets uh, for uh, selection using some sort of genomic selection um, approach uh, to select them. If you, if you just take, I think it's interesting to see as well that every one of these cases, the, the allele uh, selected under low rainfall areas does have a penalty under irrigation. Uh, in some cases, quite large. In other cases, not so large. Uh, but this is probably not surprising to see that there is a penalty for having uh, alleles that, that are favored under drought conditions. Uh, but you can also see that in every one of the cases, that allele coming from low rainfall areas uh, conferred a significant advantage under drought conditions. The middle, the middle row of, of graphs is just showing differential expression uh, of these under uh, both vegetative and reproductive tissue. So now we're, we're, we're extending this to other crops. All the work until now that I've shown you is, was for maize. Uh, we're now working also uh, with colleagues looking at sorghum. Uh, and here's a preliminary assessment done by Lasky and, and colleagues looking at genome-wide SNPs. This is for um, soil acidity or, or topsoil pH. They could find several QTL uh, associated with um, soil pH uh, and were able to predict um, relative root growth in, in um, acidic, uh, this was in solution rather actually, uh, predict uh, based on genomic uh, composition, uh, which ones would be the most likely to develop good root systems in um, acidic uh, conditions. So, Basically the same concept, but now applied uh, in sorghum. 
another example from Cowpea, uh, looking at uh, the, the differential range of uh, humidity or moisture, rainfall, uh, and temperatures, mapping them to collection sites that you can see also um, corresponding to uh, warmer areas. So it's uh, towards the hotter area. Uh, and, and of course, the, the drier area. So this area here is warmer and drier coming from the Sahelian area uh, where these cowpeas uh, collections were, were made or, or collected. And of course, they were also able to do some uh, environmental GWAS and identify some candidate genes uh, that could be useful uh, in selecting for, uh, in this case, uh, drought tolerance or, or high temperatures. So to wrap up, we, we're now starting a new project and my co-author Sarah Hearn uh, is leading this project. It's working with quite a number of partners, as you can see on this slide, from, from SEAT, from IITA, from the International Rice Research Institute, from Cornell, uh, Colorado State, uh, working on different uh, crops to implement environmental GWAS and, and take it to the next step, which is what Terry Molnar showed you, starting to make crosses and trying to incorporate uh, some of these useful uh, alleles uh, into elite materials for use in plant breeding. So these are innovative approaches uh, to use maize genetic diversity, and in this case, also cassava, cowpea, rice, and sorghum. Uh, and we'd be delighted to work with some of you uh, on, on other crops uh, to apl apply environmental GWAS. So with that, I thank you for your interest. And if there's time and questions, I'd be happy to attempt to respond. Environmental viewers. So we have time for a couple of questions. Okay, we have a question in the chat. Um, so, uh, tremendous volume of genotypic information openly available. I'm wondering if we whether there is something we could do to train others to do environmental GWAS. Right, so I saw the question, it's whether the data are openly available. And I would say 99% yes, there are some restrictions we, we place on the access to genomic data and that's essentially that you will not seek to prevent anyone else from uh, being able to use it. So you, you basically accept a term that, that indicates you won't seek any sort of proprietary rights uh, upon that information. Other than that, it's available. It's being used by, for many different purposes. Uh, a lot of PhD thesis projects come from, from using these data. And absolutely, we, we'd be, be delighted to, uh, and I think you know, Sarah Hearn, who's on the, on the call, uh, we are involving uh, postdoctoral students, and, and we would probably involve other students uh, to learn how to use and how to implement uh, environmental GWAS uh, in these different crops. Hi. Um, so I noticed that, that, that all the crops you were talking about were deployed. Um, how amenable is it to adapt to kind of more complex uh, allo polyploids and, and things like that? Is, is that in, on the horizon or a bit further away? Yeah, it's probably more complex. I mean, we, we, would, we would like to try it in wheat uh, and we're, we're requesting uh, resources to include wheat uh, into this project, but at the moment we don't have uh, the funding to, to apply it. And, um, I don't know if it's possible to, to allow um, Sarah to open her microphone, but she might have uh, other insights into, into that really good question. So if you can, Sarah, why don't you try to, to make a comment? And if it's not possible, then we'll, we'll live with it. Guess I don't hear Sarah. Maybe it's not possible for, for someone in the audience to, to open their microphone. Yes, we, we do anticipate using it for, for more complex crops and starting with wheat. Great, great. Thank you very Thank much. You. 
I seem to have lost the sound. So maybe, maybe it's my problem. I think I'll mute myself and thank you everyone for your interest and for your attention. It's not your problem. I, don't know. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a, it's a zoom to the auditorium problem. Okay.